Welcome, everybody, to the Cross Ice Feed Podcast. I'm David Stearns, joined with, as always, Brian Schrems and our special guest, A.J. Henty, our resident Dallas Stars expert. Gentlemen, how are you this evening? Thanks for having me, guys. Absolutely. Shrems. Disgruntled resident uh, <laughs> Dallas Stars fan. Oh, oh there you go. So we're going to talk some trades, and we're going to talk about trade deadline, and we're going to go a little bit further back than just the trade deadline day itself, which was, I'm not going to lie, it was one of the most boring trade deadline days until about 3 o'clock. Or well, which maybe is 2 o'clock. the case. 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock it picked up, but 3 yeah, o'clock, sure. we didn't know what was going on. So, But let's take it all the way back. We're going uh, we're gonna to bypass... Uh, a bunch of trades that happened earlier on after the lockout had ended, and we're going to go all the way up through to the Dallas Stars trading Michael Ryder back to Montreal and acquiring Eric Cole. Let's get Mr. Henty's thoughts on that. It's been about a month and a couple of weeks. How has that one transpired for the Dallas Stars, who seem to be buyers last year, bringing in Yager and company? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, Joe Noonight's uh, MO has been uh, overpaying for things. And um, I think he was looking to ship out Ryder's, uh, Ryder's contract that wasn't going to be uh, or that was going to be expiring at the end of the year and gaining uh, what he thought was going to be a young player uh, that was signed again next year. The, the, the problem is that said young player isn't so young and he, he's made of glass. So... A uh, writer who was who was pretty hot before he got traded. I feel like it's only gotten hotter as he's gone back uh, to Montreal. And um, you know, like again, like most things that Mister Newendike has decided to do, you know, we're taking a loss on this one. You have to think though. Not only did they send Michael Ryder, they're starting to dole out picks for someone like Eric Cole, who is probably one of the the biggest hot and cold players in the NHL. Plus, like you said, he's he's made of a low-grade tinfoil. And with, with that being said, you're 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 kind of turning some heads even even before the trade deadline. But it leads into another trade, which we'd heard the rumblings for a while, and you kind of got the feeling for it that um, that Brendan Morrill was going to be headed out of town. You, you've seen it for a while. You know, outside of a uh, locker room presence, you watch more games. Was was he valuable to the organization? Could you have gotten more than a a fifth round pick for him? Uh, you know, everyone's high on the prospect from Pittsburgh, and, and defense is definitely the thing that you know the Stars have been lacking ever since Zuboff has left. Um, you know, everyone thought Matt Niskanen was going to be uh, the next big thing, and he didn't pan out. And then you know, Larson came through, and uh, you know, he kind of got us Kerry Letton in. Um, and then, of course, you know, Golgowski was, you know, supposed to be, uh, I don't know, the next uh, Al McGinnis or, or Ray Bork or something. Uh, but unfortunately, none of those have panned out. So if, if this young prospect is going to be, uh, you know, that guy, then, you know, I guess we made out. But the, the way I kind of looked at the trade is you're giving up a player in Brendan Morrow who, yeah, I mean, I mean his points have regressed, obviously, with his age, but his locker room presence, I mean, he was probably one of one of the the top uh, captains in the entire league. And to ship out a guy like him along with a third-round pick in a, in a draft that's supposed to be incredibly deep, um, to only get back a, an unproven prospect who people have said has regressed a little bit in the AHL, as well as a later pick. I just didn't understand the value of it. I felt like we were, again, giving giving something away, and it's just ironic that it just happens to be Ray Shiro and the Penguins that are benefiting against. Well, let me ask you another question about uh, trades with Dallas. You know, it, it started last year when you guys picked up Yager, who ended up getting dealt away, you know, at uh, deadline day there with, uh, you know, Boston. But, um Talk about, you know, your emotions about Steve Ott. I mean, Ott was one of those uh, hard-nosed grinders that uh, <laughs> he likes to push his way around, and we do appreciate him in Buffalo, but uh, uh, Derek yes, Roy, Derek Roy, you guys thought he was the answer in Dallas for Ott. You know, trading, you know, three-letter names didn't really work out for you guys. Uh, talk about how much of an impact, uh, you know, leaving that hole from Steve Ott and then all of a sudden just dumping away Derek Roy. Yeah, I, uh, you're actually talking to one of Steve Ott's biggest fans from a very young point in his career. I've followed Steve Ott for a long time now, and 
he's honestly one of my favorite players that I've ever worn a Stars uniform. Uh, you know, being a, uh, a Stars fan um, and, a, and a diehard of that, um, you know, full disclosure is I'm a, I'm a favorite season ticket holder as well. So this trade kind of hit at home at more than one angle. And uh, Derek Roy, at the point of the trade, was in the offensive power that, you know, anybody say it, it seemed a lot, honestly, like the Eric Cole deal where we were paying for maybe what had been done in previous seasons, not what was going on at the same time. So, you know, maybe hoping that magic was going to spark or that you were going to catch lightning in a bottle. But, you know, you're taking the wrong chances on the wrong players here. Steve Ott has gone to Buffalo and he's become, you know, and what has been, you know, kind of a, a miserable season for Buffalo, which, you know, thank God it happened in a shortened season for Sabres fans' sake. It, thank you. You're, you're, you, you gained a player in Steve Ott that, in my opinion, is going to be the future captain of the organization and probably going to be there for quite some time. He signed it a very respectable deal. Um, not a bad cap hit. Um, I think he's got another two years maybe after this year, maybe one more year, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So that's that's going to be a good thing for Buffalo for years to come. And it just keeps going to show that, you know, again, we're, we're, we're not making the right deals as the Dallas Stars. We're, we're making quick deals and we're hoping and we're, we're praying. You know I mean? We're rubbing two sticks together and we're trying to get fired. It's not happening. I'm, I'm, I'm going to – Jump back to college real quick. I remember sitting in your basement with you many a late nights where we would remark about some guy in the fourth line named Ott, the hardest working player on the ice. And, you know, five years later, here he is, you know, a top line center who's hitting everybody out there and, and leading the team in points. It's, it's quite the, the progression for, for his game, but it's the, the, the whole point of, of, trading at the deadline or not trading is is to either improve your team or get some value for next season. And it seemed as though the stars were sitting in limbo towards the the deadline there. And uh you know, they ship out Yarga, they ship out Roy, they ship out Ryder. Um you know, those are those are some big names. They ship out Morrow. And they're 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 technically not out of it. They they are within five points of the playoff spot. So as as a as a fan, are you are you wanting this team to make the playoffs? Are are you concerned that if they do make the playoffs, are they just going to get blown out of the water by the by what Chicago or Anaheim in the first round, or, or what's the deal? Even worse, actually, um, I I I don't see the team making the playoffs. I see them doing exactly what we've done in recent years, um, which is very very similar to Calgary in that aspect. Um, only actually, if, if, you know, my personal opinion, even worse, which is. You know, you're going to be that one to two team that misses out. And your <laughs> my, my bigger frustration with the Stars in recent years hasn't even necessarily come from the trades. The trades have been the effect. The cause has been the poor drafting. So you're already a poor organization when it comes to drafting players, especially in the first round. Jamie Benn in the fifth round is obviously an outlier. But you're you're – going to wind up, you know, the wins this weekend are just bringing you closer and closer to that, what, 10-9 seed? It's going to put you at, what, a 13-14 a pick around there? You know, that's not the that's not the pick that we need. You know, we, we need a we need a top 10 for that matter in this trap. We need a top 5, preferably a top 3. Um, and uh, we, we're not looking at that right now, especially after taking up two wins this weekend. You know, you got basically the, uh, the Texas Stars um, you know, wearing Dallas on their on their on their chest now, and yeah. come come to Buffalo, you can play the Rochester Americans. <laughs> Absolutely, you know it's a, it's a shame we're not doing uh we're not doing air conference games here. You know, it's it's, but, it's 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 frustrating following a team in a similar in a similar circumstance that that you're you're you don't want this team to push forward towards the playoffs, but you're not going to root against the fact that they get in there. It's good money-making. It's good for the city, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I think Buffalo and and Dallas are in a similar situation right now. The team I'll that tell you, you what, I'll trade any day. What's that? I'll trade with you any day. Yeah, go ahead. You you, you can just unload all of your players on us, and, and we'll give you uh, – John Scott's nice and big, so you can uh, you can have him. 
Um, but it's it's it seems like a really unique year in that two wins can take you from from 12th place up to sixth place. And uh, I don't know. I, I think teams are, are are really confused as to what to do. There, there's only a handful of teams that, that are going to be guaranteed that that one, two, three pick. I, I don't think Calgary's going to make a late season push. I think that's pretty evident by trading a Gimlin away. I think Colorado is is going to stay down below. Florida keeps having its moments of of, of glory here, but I think they're going to be the one, two, three um, teams that are going to to round out that that very very shallow draft in terms of talent that's going to be there right away. Well, uh, <laughs> I couldn't possibly answer that because, you know what, I, I look at certain teams that may be looking to trade up, and it may be Florida that will take a trade from teams that have as many draft picks as 10 this year, namely the Buffalo Sabres, uh, as we've talked about, you know, here and there. Being that it is a deep draft, um, do you trade up or do you take your chances on later round picks in this kind of uh, circumstance is my question to you guys. You can start with that one, AJ. Um, I'm a I'm a I'm a prospect guy. I really enjoy the draft, and uh, I've been following Nathan McKinnon for a long time, mm-hmm. um, as as well as Seth Jones. And it, it, you're not going to be able to go wrong either way. And the beautiful part, I guess, to that whole thing is that that's one in three. There's still a guy ranked second that no one's even talking about. So I, 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 I would trade up. If I was, you know, again, if I'm Joe Neuendijk and, you know, I'm taking Scott Glenny at 14 overall or 12 overall or whatever absurd number he went in. I actually think it was earlier. I think he was top 10. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to trade up, and, and I'd rather not blow my tent and instead – you know, at least get a surefire thing in the top three, top five. I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you with McKinnon. He's, he, he would be the player that I would want to, to, to center my team around. It's, I mean, they, they, they've alluded that he could be a, a watered down version of Crosby if he can mature just a little bit more. Um, I, I, I don't mind defenders, but. Unless you have a, a Nick Lindstrom type player coming through, you're not going to build a team around a defender. Many teams have tried, and it, and it hasn't gone very well. Um, I can only think of a handful of teams in the league now that you can actually build a defender, or you can build your team around a defender. Nashville's one, but that team is so so mismanaged offensively that you really want to you really want to invest highly in in a defender first overall when you are an absolute mess up front. And I, I I I have a hard time taking a defender, especially with these teams coming through and I am not thinking a defender is what they're looking for. Well teams that'll be high in the draft, I mean look looking at the uh the rankings as far as, uh, you know, like Jones is at the top of the list, but, you know, other players coming from, like, the OHL that are up there at the top as well, like Darnell Nurse and then uh, the WHL's Ryan Pollock. You know, okay, if you want to start with a defender to build the core of your team, that's all well and good. If you want to go the whole Mike Illich route, building your team around, like a player like Lidstrom, as you're talking about. But my question is just really, can a team build with one player out of the draft at number one, two, or three, like the Pittsburgh Penguins have and the Washington Capitals have with Crosby and Ovechkin, because we remember where those two teams were previous or prior to the lockout, and then the resurgence those two teams had after the lockout because of those two particular players. Can a team like Florida or Colorado or Calgary or maybe even Tampa Bay at that matter, I mean, we, we've already seen them pick up Stamkos and have a good run at it, but nothing... Nothing is really consistent here like Pittsburgh, and I guess if you want to make the argument Washington, uh, though they've been really hot lately, this year it looked like they were going to miss the playoffs, but uh, it's the Southeast Division. And by the way, enjoy it while you can because next year's realignment, all things, all sorts of things are going to happen. But uh, we're no longer going to have that beast of a Southeast where we only have one team making it. But the question is, 
looking at the way teams have been trading away picks like this, are, is there even going to be a top pick available for one of these floundering teams at the bottom, or have they all traded them away? I haven't, I haven't really done the research to find out if any of the lower seed teams right now in either the West or the East have any top picks left. Um, the way it's looking right now is is that the the projection is Colorado, Florida, and uh, Calgary go one, two, three. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine. I mean, it, the mock draft has Jones, Druin, and then McKinnon going third. I, I, I can't say that that Colorado has those pieces. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think it's there. Florida, maybe. Florida has has a lot of youngsters. That there's a lot of promise on that team. And and Calgary is in is in full rebuild mode. They they need that one player. They need that McKinnon player to build their team around. They don't have it. They just traded away their their biggest asset. Now what if I what if I throw a curveball out there and say why why are we looking at just the, just those three? Because if we look at even last season, you know, Columbus wound up with the second overall pick, not the first. Right. And remember, the draft has changed this coming year to where all of the teams that miss out on the playoffs are going to at least have a chance. It's no more of this. You can only move up four spots. So, it, it, in, in my opinion, if you look at a team that's starting to inch near the bottom, like, you know, I mean, if we look at just, you know, I mean, just going off of today, the Tampa, Carolina, if Philly strikes lightning in the bottle again with a JBR. You know, I hate to cross sports here, but the Bulls have done this with Derrick Rose. Is the talent drop-off or the, the expectation of, of making the team right out of the draft here, it seems to go away after three. Mm-hmm. The, the, the projections after McKinnon, Drew, and, and Jones are Barkoff, Lindholm, Monaghan, Nurse, names that, that, that aren't... That that don't have that buzz right now. I'm, I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking if you want your your three out of the draft into a uniform next season, it's going to be Drew and Jones and, and McKinnon. Well, I totally I totally agree on that. But uh, let let's just uh, we spent a lot of time talking about draft here. Let's let's get back on topic. We're about 18 minutes deep into this here, and let's get back to the trades because you know we're going to have a special show set aside just for the draft. We're going to talk in depth about the draft rankings going into the draft weekend, and we'll talk more at length about that because we have plenty of players that we could analyze even deeper than maybe what these what these rankings are saying because, yeah, you're right, Shrems, that it appears that it drops off one, two, three, but then again, you never know. You could see somebody going in the third round that you didn't see coming that turns out to be, you know, or maybe at it, it, the 56th or 55th pick that happens to be Jason Pominville, um, and it turns out to be, you know, the, the anchor of your team, and then suddenly you could trade them away for four players, uh, well, two players and two picks. So let's go to the trades. Uh, Shrems, where do you want to start on this one? Uh, which ones really stood out to you that really got the ball rolling as far as this year's trades? I, I think the biggest talker of, of trade deadline day was obviously the Gabrick deal. Okay. And we, we alluded to it in the last podcast. You, you have this team in, in New York that brings in this superstar line that, that can't fail. I mean, you have the best goaltender in the league. You have Brad Richards, Rick Nash, and Marion Gabrick, um, a, a, a solid veteran center with two superstar wingers around you. You, you trade away some decent depth. Yeah, uh, I get that. But we come to find out, once again, you, you can't just stockpile these superstars and expect them to go out there and win you a championship. Um, the chemistry obviously has not been here, and I think I, my hat's off to New York for recognizing that and getting rid of the player that's least likely to benefit them long term, given his injury ability or his, his injury proneness. And, and his, I don't know, moodiness, for, for lack of a better word. Um, you get 100% out of Rick Nash, you get 100% out of Brad Richards. I, I don't think you could say the same for Marion Gabbard. Mm-hmm. But he is, he's in an environment where he can now thrive as the number one guy out on the ice. And he certainly has done so, so far. And on the flip side, the Rangers have the depth that they need to 
be an impressive playoff team, though. Henty, do you got something on this trade in particular? I mean, I'm looking at, you know, pretty much Broussard and Dorsett on, on that side, and, and more for that matter, but do they want to just add toughness to their lineup in New York? I mean, we all know that John Tortorella is a tough coach, but did he want people to bang bodies on the ice too? I mean, obviously when we think of somebody that bangs around bodies, I mean, we're obviously going to go and look at uh, Derek Dorsett. Oh, absolutely, and and that's the type of player that John Tortorella, you know, a tough-nosed coach, much much like a guy like a Lindy Ruff was. You know, they like those type of players. Um, you know, I uh, Derek Broussard, you know, that's a guy that you know he's had this hype around him. You know, could he break out? Could he not break out? Uh, you know, personally, uh-uh. <laughs> you're not gonna break out with Rick Nash. I don't know if you're breaking out, but. He had an impressive debut. That was good for him. Uh, I think the bigger part of that deal wasn't honestly what the Rangers got. It's what they unloaded. Um, I don't think Gabrick was a Tortorella guy. Um, but, I mean, I don't think that's a secret to anyone. Um, but I think that getting that attitude out of the locker room sometimes is more of a win in a trade than what's actually done on paper or on the score sheet. Um, you know, in all honesty, you know, much like the Stars get rid of Sean Avery a few years back. You know, you sometimes you got to get the bad seat out of the locker room in order to have your team actually reach full full, full potential. It's you and we mentioned it last time as well. You have three highly paid players that come with three very big egos in your locker room, and we've seen time and time again in professional sports you can load up with the, the best, most expensive players around. But if there is no chemistry there, if you don't have three or four balanced lines, it's going to get you nowhere. And and Gabrick could be one of the best players in the world. He does have his injury issues. But when he is the center of attention or when he shares the spotlight with someone like Pat Holdenatra, um he can click. I, I just think it was a little too crowded, but, but like AJ said, you unload that contract, you unload that, that ego onto a team that doesn't necessarily have it, but is looking for someone they, could, they can rally around, especially for a playoff push. Columbus is or was, at the beginning of the season, a thousand to one to win the Stanley <laughs> Cup. Um, they were written off completely, and even the start of the season, they were terrible. They found this goaltender in Sergei Bobrovsky who has was, was, had a nice little career resurgence. We saw him in Philly, played well, kind of got bounced around from there. Um, but he seems to be settling in. They unloaded Mason, which is good. Um, get that guy a starting job next year when they ship out with Goloff from Philadelphia. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, 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 really, I'm, I'm going to jump on board with the, the Blue Jackets. I'm, I'm looking forward to see what they can do in these last 10 games. Yeah, the Blue Jackets. Well, yeah, are... and, oh. and the Blue Jackets are going to line up next year with uh, with technically a, uh, a free trade of their own when they get Murray back, right? Uh... <laughs> Man, Trent really is not a defender guy. I mean, no, did no, you grow no, up no. in Buffalo? Uh, <laughs> did you did you see what we grew up with in Buffalo? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Am I supposed to rally around Alexei Zitnik and, and Richard uh, Schmelich? <laughs> We're waiting the Zitnik name drop. Okay. Oh. Please, Hal. I was able to grab that name drop. That's all I needed. I yeah. <laughs> Bring on had, Doug, uh, Doug had 10 7 in the Zitnik pool. Oh, jeez. <laughs> um, oh. I, I, I'd like to bounce uh, another trade, the one that kind of um, kind of – Surprised me. My surprise trade of the day uh-huh. um, came between Ottawa and Tampa. Oh yeah. This gotcha. year, and and uh, my my hat goes off to AJ for pouncing on him before I did. Um, this little man emerged alongside of Marty St. Louis and Vincent LeCavier um, and Corey Conacher, and this guy exploded out of nowhere and just took off. And and there was a there was a, a, a good feeling in Tampa Bay, knowing that your veterans are, are maybe moving on. Who are we going to pass the torch to? Uh, Teddy Purcell, yeah, that sounds nice. Uh, 
maybe you can keep Stan Post around for a couple more years. He's pretty good, I guess. But um, Corey Conacher seems to be filling out that, that piece of the puzzle, that top-line piece, and then all of a sudden they ship him off for Ben Bishop, who I believe is, what, six foot seven on skate? He's a monster. The guy is absolutely gigantic. It made no sense to me bringing in Bishop after you bring in Andres Lindbach in the off season. You haven't given him much of a chance to mature into your starting goaltender, mm-hmm. and now you have three goaltenders who don't really know their position in the team. Did I see Rollison sure. last night? By the way, did he? Did, was he in net? Is he still alive? <laughs> is my question. <laughs> I think he was in that. By the way, that, wrong, that man was uh, wrong church. 41. Right, wrong church, right pew, by the way. It was me that picked up Corey Conacher. So, Are you sure? Yes, I have him on my roster, sir. I'm pretty sure of it. His name is on my roster. Would you like to yes, his like name is on your roster. He went to you when I grabbed Alex Catrangelo. Oh, oh, there was a trail. That trade took place. That's I f- right. I forgot about that. I, I Gordon mean, Conacher was picked up before Puck even dropped on opening night because he uh, spent the beginning of the season playing in lovely Syracuse, New York, and ripping oh, Puck's cage out. That's right. Okay, so so you had him eyeballed the entire time, and you know what? I, I, I picked up Mike Ribeiro, and everyone laughed at me. That's the one I was thinking about. So oh, okay. I laughed at you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. People laughed. Uh, but, you know, this trade with Ben Bishop going down to Tampa, yeah, you know, it does surprise me with Lindbach being there. And, you know, it, it it does surprise me that they do this. But you know what? He's proven himself. And the thing is, Ottawa kind of had a goaltending uh, issue themselves. They had Leonard that was pr- playing great hockey as Anderson was out. Anderson's back, and then all of a sudden his uh, return party got spoiled last night. So my question is, did they did they shoot the gun a little too early on that one? And should they have held on to Bishop up there in Ottawa? My my initial reaction, and I'll let AJ take it, is I was watching a um, an AHL game the other day, and they couldn't speak more highly of Robin Lehner, who is supposedly supposed to be the future goaltender of the Ottawa Senators, and um, you know they're going to ride out Anderson. Somebody said Vesna candidate for Anderson, which is That's, a bold statement given yeah. given the company that he has in that category, but he's had a good season. But is he the future of that organization? No. It, it sounds like Rob Lehner is, is going to be the guy they're going to turn to in the next couple of years or so. Mm-hmm. But Bishop, just given his stature, given given what he has potential to do, they, they got a pretty good player out of him. Hopefully, for them, Conacher doesn't bust, but I, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I saw Silkburn Turris and Conniger on the same line the other night. It was a thing of beauty. Once you get Spezza back in the mix there, I, I think they're going to be pretty pretty happy with what they got in Ottawa. This team does need to build around a goaltender, and looking at his stats right now, his stats look solid. Goals against average, 234, save percentage, 93%. The only problem with that is he's gotten into 10 games but only has a 3 win and 3 loss uh, going on there. It, you know what? You need to string together more wins, and if you're not putting the puck in the net on the other side, it's not going to help your goaltender's case whatsoever. I mean, he's putting up solid numbers, but you know, adding Conacher to the mix, I think, is a is a, is a great addition for them. And uh, you know, yeah, you're right. When Spezza comes back, uh, that team is going to be complete. But you know, you weren't convinced last year when uh, they made their case for the playoffs. What about this year? Hey, did he take that one? I gotta think about that one for a minute. Ah. Yeah, I mean, I I think this year for and and you know from a from an Ottawa standpoint, um, I, I'm not buying into that team. I know they they brought the Rangers close, but I'm sorry, I just can't. <laughs> they're the devils to me. They're they're. It, they're good right now. It's a shortened season. I'll give a couple of their their players some credit, but I just don't see that team. I think Shrems brings up a great point with Spezza coming back. I think that's a, a phenomenal point. I think he could ignite some greatness in it wherever he falls into, whether it's Conacher, whether it's it's Silverberg. I, I think Silverberg's going to be a, a stud one day. I, I saw the other night uh, 
um, Silverberg with with uh, Simbajet and Conacher at the Buffalo game. I didn't see Turris. Turris was in front. Um, and they, you're you're right. They're a thing of beauty. I mean, they're they're offensively sound. I just don't see whether it's Langer or Craig Anderson being that relevant. Whereas with Tampa, same type of thing. I mean, you know, I know that. You know, they, they're technically not eliminated from the playoffs yet. I don't know exactly who is. Um, you know, as we were saying they're earlier, way, though. you know, a game a game or two with, with a win streak brings you up, you know, eight slots in the standings. But, um, it, you know, I, that was one of those trades where I feel like there's too much risk going on with both sides that it actually was a pretty even deal because I think they both have equal chances to bust. Yeah, I, I, where, where's your head at on the the more bust worthy player? I honestly think that if there was a bigger bust, I think I think it's got to go with Conacher, and it's only really? because, of where, because of where he comes from. We're talking about an undrafted player on a Canisius college, <laughs> not a proven OHL talent. It's always been said that goaltenders take the longest to develop, right? I mean, look at Tim Thomas. And I don't even mean to give that guy an ounce worth of credit because I think he's a scumbag for what he told me here. <laughs> but, but to not even go down that road, I I think a guy like Bishop with his stature, um, I I think he's he's he gets a couple extra years, I guess. I guess he gets a in, – in my book, he gets a couple extra years of – I'm going to give you time versus Conacher, who, you know, I mean, we've seen these offensive flashes in the pan. Um, you know, see Billy Leno, who, who Shrems and I spoke about earlier. Uh, moving you know, on. Strike to move forward, or whatever they say. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've seen these things. And, and trust me, I think, you know, I, I, I love the Conacher story because, you know, to go way back, I mean, this this guy, the first week of the, the season this year where there was no AHL hockey, so all anybody had was the AHL. He was the player of the week for the first week of the season. I forget his exact point total, but he wound up with, I think in the first like, three games of the season, he had like eight points or something like that, six points, whatever it was. Uh, he went on a tear. Yeah, and I mean, this is a college kid, and he's tiny. I mean, he's little. I mean, Shrems, I, I, I giggled to myself when you made your comment of, of this little man alongside Marty St. Louis, because I mean, if you can look little alongside Marty St. Louis, I mean, we got we got some 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 real real small people we're talking about here. So uh, I um, I definitely think that Bishop just gets a little bit more of a leeway. Just um, you know, I think he might be just a tad safer of a bet. Although uh, with the with the talent that Tampa could have, um, you know, I think that they're they're missing the boat completely on either goaltender. I have a, uh, a short list, the top 20 undrafted players, best players in the NHL today. Um, Gilroy, Bozak, Conklin, Fedotenko, Giordano, Rene Bork, Rolison, Andy McDonald, Chris Kunitz went undrafted, uh, Bobrovsky, Girardi, Joey Leno, um, <laughs> Nick Backstrom from Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Uh, John Madden, if he's still on skates anywhere. Jonas Hiller didn't get drafted. Penner didn't get drafted. Burroughs. Dan Boyle didn't get drafted. Brian Rafalski, not around anymore. And Marty St. Louis did not get drafted. Well, that's a uh, solid you, list. <laughs> now, how many of those players do you want to build a team around? Maybe four or five. So yeah. the likelihood of Conacher being that player who's going to turn heads over the next couple of years and, and turn into a, a late round or non drafted no. um, superstar like a dad suit. I don't see it happening. No. Well, but I, I yeah. just think people are buying too much into that that the, the stature of that goaltender. Whenever anybody, anybody talks about Ben Bishop, oh he's so big, there, there's no way he can be, you know, beaten. He's he's uh, an awesome an awesome presence and uh, they decide to make the nets bigger or what have you. He should be covered. He's, he's going to be just fine. But I think we've seen our fair share of, of large goaltenders in the past um, not have the success that was intended by their size. 
Well, let's put the nail in the coffin in this uh, in this trade here. All right, so just to keep this in mind, I'm going to ask a yes or no question. The Ottawa Senators allow are currently allowing the second least amount of goals in the league, but they are the fourth least in goal scoring right behind the New York Rangers. Do they stay in a playoff spot, and if they do, will they go deeper than the first round? No, you need stress in Carlson. You okay. do that, you're sitting third or fourth, I believe. Okay. AJ? Uh, I'm going to go ditto. Right, right. They took the words right out of my mouth. All right. Well, let's move on Absolutely to agree. let's move on to other trades here that took place on trade day. Uh, well, let's let's just briefly talk about the Yager trade up to Boston. Is that even worth it? Uh, AJ, let's start with you. Was it worth it for Boston to pick him up? Oh, absolutely. Okay. For what Boston gave up, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's a fun fact behind that trade. Um, Dallas declined a very similar version of that trade about two weeks earlier for Brendan Morrow. <laughs> so they, and that's a true story. So they technically got Yager for the price of Morrow. Um, I, I think, I. I I had doubts on Yager coming to Dallas, especially, you know, after him lighting the lamp in Philly last year. But then I started remembering to myself at the time of this trade here that I doubted him when he came back last year and came to Philly. He's clearly proven that he can still score. And the one thing that's always motivated Yager is fame and fortune. So uh, a, a Stanley Cup ring and a team like Boston who – I'm going to be full full disclosure here. I actually chose that would be in the Cup final against Chicago this year. I was anti Pittsburgh. Um, yeah. I still think Boston uh, has what it takes to win the East, and I think Yager only helps that it doesn't hurt it. When you can slide a guy like Nate Horton down to your third line, you got something. You're not doing you're not doing too many things wrong. My my, and I'm gonna uh, I'll jump in and then I'll kick it to you, Stern. Okay. My question is, with the recent loss and potentially career-ending injury to Patrice Bergeron, um, do they have what it takes? Is 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 it there still? Obviously, Pittsburgh has gotten three or four players more solidly uh, or, or more. Grounded into their into their lineup, um, you take out a player like Bergeron from Boston. He's kind of a focal point for that offense. He's he's a reliable player. He does have his injury issues, and it's showing now. Does that take away? Does that put more pressure on someone like Yager to go out there and and perform as to where maybe if Bergeron was still in the lineup, he could you know step step back a little bit if need be. He gets a little bit winded because of his age. You know, he doesn't have to go full steam because the team around him is, is just that good. I honestly think that Pittsburgh's got this one in the bag now because of that. Um, you, I don't know if they have as much depth. Uh, you don't have any 20-goal players under the 38 games that they've played, or the 37 games, or 38. Um, you Going down the line... Who are you going to rely on with Yager? Are you going to say that David Krejci and Brad Marchand are going to lead the team to a Stanley Cup? I mean, the next in line there is Tyler Sagan and Lucic and, and Horton. I don't think that they have the right depth. I think, if anything, they're, they've are they got the makings of a goon squad, which they do kind of have a reputation of having in recent years. But uh, do they have the depth in offense to get it done? I, I don't think they do. With Bergeron out, I mean, yes, they've... <laughs> They've missed him in some crucial moments, but they still have gotten the job done, as we've seen a couple of years back. But whether or not they can do it this year, I, I don't think so. And, and I think the last time we talked, you gave a lot of credit to Tuka Rask, and I don't think that a goaltender can necessarily carry the team by himself all the way through. Uh, you definitely do need some solid offensive core up front and some secondary scoring, and I don't think Boston has it right now. Here's, here's what Boston does have. They have a young upstart goaltender who has a lot to prove. Here's what Pittsburgh has. They have a inconsistent playoff goaltender in Marc-Andre Fleury, and I, I don't care for the way that he's played in previous years, especially mm -hmm. last year in the playoffs. That whole Philadelphia mm -hmm. series was one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen, and 
you can have all the offense in the world, but if he goes cold in the playoffs, it's an early exit and, and, and many questions as to where do we go from here. And by the way, I don't I don't care about the fact that they just beat Carolina six to two while we were recording this either. But um, you know, Tuka Rask and Marshawn and Seidenberg were the three stars. I I really how, don't. How many saves? How many, how many saves did Rask have tonight? Uh, he had forty two saves. So. Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. So, all right, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But it's Carolina. It's Carolina. But yes, they did pepper him. Uh, the you thing gotta is, remember, they still didn't give. Uh, you know, again, coming from a, a stars perspective, uh-huh. you know, you, you 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 gave us a bag of pucks and a couple of water bottles, Boston. <laughs> thanks. I mean, you know, so you know, maybe some. Yeah, I, I I'm not even gonna go down that route, but you're you're you, you know, maybe some Celtics tickets. You know, what I mean, for the playoffs. You know, we got oh. those to come watch. Uh, you know, it's it's not no pricey. Uh, it's not. <laughs> They didn't. It's not like they gave up much to do it. So I don't think that taking on Yager was that big a risk. All right. Well, we're towing up on 40 minutes here. We are a little over time, but you know what? Let's keep going let's, with the. Let's co- close out. Let's you close, close out, out with the last big, but last we, big deal of the day. We barely even talked about the Jerome Ginla, um trade that I predicted to Pittsburgh that you owe me a pop for. So. Um, uh, I told you there's no duels in my fridge waiting for you to uh, come get this week. That doesn't even um, count as beer. There's no alcohol content. Real uh. quick, real quick. We'll do a Ginla, and then we'll go to what okay. everybody was saying was the quietest, best deal of the day. The quietest, um, best deal. <laughs> a Ginla to Pittsburgh, obviously, that's just, I mean, could you imagine when everybody's healthy, Crosby, Malkin, a Ginla, um, uh, who else? Put Latang out there and put James and Neal out there. Disgusting. I mean, that that's one of the most ridiculous units that you can have in hockey today. And Pittsburgh did, um, didn't did give up much for Aginla, which really kills me. I mean, Agostino, yeah, I can maybe see, but uh, Hanowski and a first-round pick in 2013, if you're getting a pick from the Pittsburgh Penguins, it's going to be a, it's going to be a low pick in the first round. I mean, yeah, it's you, which which they can give up. True. They're... they're 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 going to be just fine for the next three or four years with the players they have. So why not trade them away for a chance at a championship? I, I like this trade a lot. I really do think that Pittsburgh has the depth now to take it home, even if Crosby's out right now. Uh, after that brutal deflection off of that, what was it an Orpic shot from the point that took out uh, his jaw? Um, oh. I uh, that was that was a brutal, brutal, brutal shot to watch happen there. But uh, I think. Once he gets back in the lineup, too, yeah, this is going to be a team that is going to dismantle their opponents going through th- throughout the playoffs here. I mean, we only got nine games left in the season, and I think as soon as Crosby comes back, this team is unstoppable. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold you to that Mark andre Fleury comment. He's got a... Oh, come on, Vokun, Vokun. <laughs> what about him? Well, it, this team has only allowed 95 goals. That's pretty damn impressive, if you ask me. And plus, their home record is second best, I believe, in the league right now, if not the best. I mean, that's great. I mean, I mean, good for them. Flurry is is a very inconsistent playoff goaltender. You and I and AJ. Yeah, we know that. We all know that. So mm. if if he look at the team last year, that that team was was just as good, maybe a little bit less now. But but still, these same expectations. And look what happened in Philadelphia. You're giving up eight goals a game. Well, when it comes down, I, to, I don't know. When it comes down to Pittsburgh, that and was Montreal. just the first yeah. round. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was round one. So then they have to get through four total, and and then you get bounced yeah. by a team like the Devils. Okay, if it's and you got to <sighs> go ahead. You got to remember you're you're talking about you know and Shrem named off of uh, uh, an all star team. When talking about the Pittsburgh lineup, but let's think about this right now. Malkin concussion this year. Mm. Crosby plastic surgery galore. Like yeah, yep. it's a real housewife of Pittsburgh. <laughs> honestly, um, James Neal concussion right now. Latang he's got groin and foot problems. It's not like we're talking about the healthiest bunch coming in. I mean, it's it's kind of sad when Jerome McGinley is the healthiest guy, right? But they're still getting the job done. I, I, uh, I, I don't know. That's that's all right. That's going to be interesting to see how it plays out over the next couple weeks. Okay, we got it on tape, so let, let's move on. <laughs> we 
the, what, did you record that on your boombox? Uh, you yes, got that on tape? yes, I did. Uh, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> moving yes. on. The trade of the day. Go ahead. Well, well, it doesn't appear to be on paper the trade of the day, but it's the one that all the anal- uh, the the um, uh, everybody everybody on the radio, everybody on XM, everybody on TV keeps going back to this trade is is the biggest trade of the day, the quiet biggest trade of the day. And, it, and it's, it's Pomodoro, Minnesota. And, and, I, and I think it's, the reason is, is that Minnesota is getting very hot at the right time. And they have a goaltender who easily goes overlooked year in and year out just because the team has no offense. But now they add a, a nice piece to the puzzle. They're finally gelling on all cylinders like they were expected to do early on in the season. But as we all know, it takes some time to get that chemistry going in game-type situations. I don't know. Pominville might have just locked in a, a deep run to the playoffs here. I like this trade for a couple of different reasons. Um, yeah, when we first heard it come out, we didn't know that there were two draft picks tacked on with this one, too. So all I heard was Jason Pominville for Matt Hackett and Johan Larson. I'm like... Who the hell is Larson and Hackett, and why do I care about them? And why would Darcy Regeer be stupid enough just to trade Pominville, who is a known goal scorer and maybe not the best captain the Sabres have ever had? Uh, I mean, real but timid guy. a respectable player. Exactly. To say the least. So, I mean, obviously we know that, you know, Matt Hackett is the nephew of Jeff Hackett. And aside from that, we don't know much else. I mean, he's just... You know, everybody up in Minnesota thinks he's like the goalie of the future, and you could build a team around him. And then Larson, he's he's one of those prospects that he could he has the great potential. And he was on the Swedish uh, junior team that won the World Juniors. And and I'm thinking to myself, okay, but how does that equate to Jason Pominville? I had I, I I couldn't put it together. And then an hour later, they announced it. Oh, by the way, there was a first round pick for this year and a second round pick for next year included there. I'm like, okay, what else did we give up then? Oh, fourth round pick in 2014. Okay, I'm okay with this trade. I am I am thrilled with it because we know that the Buffalo Sabres are going to be dumping off all of the core players that they've built this team around, like Vanek and Miller and Pommetville. Obviously, we've seen a bunch of other players leave over the course of the last year, like Derek Roy. But, yeah, we're going to start building around the younger talent that's currently in Rochester and possibly some of these draft picks, if we get them early enough, that are impact, immediate impact players. Hopefully not another Gregorenko, but let's see what they do with these draft picks because Buffalo has 10 draft picks now thanks to this trade. I mean, it's a perfect even number. Um, Let me answer this. Because AJ and I were talking about this on on the way home today. You have a team in Minnesota that has quietly come to life here over the past week or so. And you have Parise now. You have uh, Koivu, who is one of the most underrated centers in the league. Um, you got Pomazel, you got Heatley, you got you got Suter on the point. Yep. You got a couple uh, of, of of good young defenders in in Gilbert and Spurgeon. You have a sound goaltender who, if he can remain healthy, is, is probably one of the most underrated goaltenders in the league. Is is this a team that's going to turn a lot of heads? Could this team knock off someone like Chicago? I think so. I think they can. I mean, Chicago, yes. They are a hot team, but you know what? Every hot team does fizzle out and cool off for a little bit here. And with the shortened season, the way it's set up, when you do the math, this would be kind of a mid-season, and a lot of teams go through a mid-season slump. I think Chicago might be heading down that path. And, you know, I <sighs> Chicago's got a lot of names. They're kind of like the New York Rangers of the West, but except they're actually doing something. Their names work. Exactly. Their names work, and they work well. I mean, Patty Kane and uh, Hosa and Taves and uh, Seabrook, the, the list goes on and on. I actually think Minnesota can do it, and they are low enough down. I mean, remember last year we had a number eight seed, and L.A. Kings get hot at the right point in the season and accomplish this. Minnesota can do what the L.A. Kings did last year. Let, let me ask you, well, let me ask A.J. this. You have... You have this this new NHL, I guess. It's all well and good if you can put up 105, 110 points in a season as a team. Is it more about getting hot at the right time 
and going into the playoffs with any momentum like the Kings did, like the Wild could potentially do this year, or are the teams that are tie- tried and tested throughout the season, are those the ones that we're going to be seeing in the, in the finals this year? Uh, you know, I, I, I thought about what you said about Minnesota, and you're right. They, they literally have the same recipe uh, that, that the L.A. did last year. Um, I I think that the Heatley injury is gonna gonna hurt a little bit because there goes your second line scoring power. I, I agree that Parise um, and and Koivu, I'm, uh, my God, I, I think he is one of the most underrated players in the entire league. Nobody gives that guy credit for everything that he does. Yep. You know, power play, penalty kill, um, face off, everything. Um, I don't know if the Wild are going to be that team to do it. You know, I think that you have to have, if we're talking about those middle-of-the-pack teams, you know, who's, who could be an L.A. team that could, you know, upset a Chicago um, or a Vancouver, I guess, you know, I mean, when you look at the top, um, you know, I, I honestly think San Jose is really the one that could do it. Um, I know that we've been saying that for years, and it just doesn't happen, but... <laughs> They've been quietly putting together this streak here, and the names on the score sheet are not Marlowe and Thornton like it was at the beginning of the year. And I think that that's a little bit telling as to uh, you know what that team might be able to do. You know, we talk about trading off bad players, bad attitudes. I think getting rid of Ryan Klo might have been that type of an attitude on that team. There were rumors that he was telling uh, you know uh, uh, management that he wanted five million dollars a season for six years. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think I, I just don't see Minnesota having it just yet, even though I do like their addition in Pommelville and, and even more of the fact I actually love what Buffalo got back. Well, San Jose better start doing something on the road because if they're at the bottom of the standings here, look at this, they only have one loss at home, but they've only won six out of 18 on the road. <laughs> so... Yeah, I think home ice advantage is something that they're going to want to fight for. But yeah, San Jose, all right. Uh, I I actually thought they were going to go deep this year before the season started, but um, my thoughts have changed dramatically on that. At the beginning, they looked really good up there with Chicago. They had a hot start, both those teams. One team remained, and that was Chicago. So, But Minnesota, they're turning it on at the right time, and they've got they've got depth. I mean, even without Heatley, I would say they still have depth. I was going to say, does the Heat? I mean, I mean, I mean, am I am I giving Heatley too much credit? Maybe, and maybe I am. You know, I mean, I I I I just look at him and the second line. You know, Setaguchi's there. He's hot right now. Oh, it took him a while. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it took him um, way too long. Yeah, it took yeah, about three so years. Right. Yeah. <laughs> He's. Him and, him and Brent Burns move at the same pace. <laughs> like what I did there, huh? Uh. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> I um, but, but, yeah, yeah, I I, uh, I do like what Minnesota is doing, and they are hot right now, and grabbing a guy like Jason Tomlinville, where, you know, was he a great captain for Buffalo? And maybe not, but is he a good leader? Yes. And on a team that's, you know, got a, a, a couple of, of natural leaders in a Parise and in a Koivu, um, you know, and in a proven goalie like Trump said, I don't think Baxter gets enough credit either. Um, you know, I, I guess, yeah, they could do it. I just, I I don't see, and maybe I don't see anybody in the West doing it. I, I don't see Chicago getting knocked off. I, I honestly don't. I don't think Anaheim can do it. Um, I don't think they have the goal standing for it unless, uh, unless one of those two literally catch, like, Ryan Miller and the Olympic steroids. Like, I'm talking about, like, you, you need to stand on your head. But I, when you look at San Jose, they have a goalie that's won the Cup. Yeah, he had a good team in front of him, but he had a young team in front of him. So um, I I still think that's a team that could do it. And Thornton doesn't have a ton of time left in him. Neither does Boyle. And I'm so sick of talking about Patrick Marlowe. I think he's just <laughs> Still Nobody wants him. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, are we just going to go yeah, ahead? We're going to wrap this up, man. Yeah. It's let's 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 just totally discredit the Ryan Clo trade. Let's just say that that means nothing. And uh, 
Uh, I actually thought the biggest trade of the day was the one that the Washington Capitals pulled off with Philip Forsberg for Martin Irak and um, Michael Latta. So uh, we will close it out here, and we will catch up with you all next week. We promise we won't leave a two-week gap because we are down to the final nine games of the season. And so we will catch up with you all real soon. Thanks to our special guest, AJ Hente, for stopping by here. And hopefully we'll see you in future episodes. AJ. Yeah, I want to thank you guys both very much for letting me come on. It's been a blast. So I, uh, you know, cheers to both of you guys. I really appreciate it. All right. Hopefully, we can give you the chance to vent a little bit. Yeah, Thanks you know, it's, it's it's you know, we can do a Dallas Stars hour one day. <laughs> <laughs> do Dallas Stars day one day if you want. To. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll go over the last like four years or so. You know, ever since the Detroit Conference Finals loss, we'll take it from there. <laughs> Sounds good. We'll catch you on the 30 and 30 uh, segment we'll run during the summer. Uh, I don't know if we're <laughs> actually going to do it in 30 days, but we'll we'll do it over the course of however long it takes us. So. <laughs> <laughs> I like that idea, actually. Let's talk about that when we hang up here. Yeah, we will. We will. All right. We'll catch up with everyone next week. We'll have another special guest or two next time around here on the Cross Ice Feed. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and as always, don't stop believing.